the Coast of Maha because we are involved in the organisation of the Optical Microscopy Workshop there, which is normally an annual event, but because of funding and COVID, we've not been there for a few years. So it's nice to join you virtually in a place that I, I, I love very much. Um, so unfortunately, I can't be there in person. Uh, but I'd like to talk to you today about some of the work we've been doing in the mesoscale. So we have developed a unique objective lens that we call the mesolens. And we've been using it for a number of different types of application in 2D <clears throat> and 3D optical mesoscopy. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I'll start off by introducing what the mesoscale is, why it's important, why we actually care about imaging there at all. I'll then go on to explain our solution to imaging the mesoscale in the form of the mesolens and what, what, it, what it effectively does. Uh, I'll then talk about two different imaging modes that we've developed uh, that are compatible with the mesolens, uh, namely confocal and wide field uh, imaging uh, in the mesoscale. And I'll conclude by explaining what we're doing with the mesolens now in the Moon Lab in collaboration also with uh, other researchers across the UK and worldwide. And then what we hope to do next, obviously funding permitting. So <clears throat> we'll start with some introduction. If you are reading almost any biological uh, paper, it will invariably have a microscope image. And that's because the, the optical microscope, and I realise I'm preaching to converted here, is, is now considered to be such a widespread tool in uh, biological and biomedical sciences that it's almost expected that there will be a, an, an imaging micrograph to accompany any piece of scientific work in that field. And images of the type up here like the one that's shown on the screen here, where the researcher has taken at some point, although this is a company, this is a proprietary slide. Uh, this is a mouse kidney section. Uh, you can buy this from Thermal Fisher or Life Technologies or whatever they are now called. Um, and this particular section has been stained with three fluorescent dyes, only two which are shown here. And apologies for the red green uh, colour table. This is not my image, as I'll explain in a moment or two. The, the green is uh, wheat germ agglutinin 48, um, so it's an uh, antibody staining, and uh, the red is LS4568 phylloid. Um, and there's also a DAPI nuclear marker in there too. Now, this image was taken by Kurt Thorne. And Kurt's an excellent microscopist, and those of you that are fond of microscopy will notice that there's a scale bar missing. And it's missing with good reason. It's not because Kurt has omitted it, but it's because uh, this image is cropped from uh, the image that Kurt actually took. So we used a technique known as stitching and tiling or mosaicing to make a two-dimensional reconstruction of a much larger tissue specimen because the mouse kidney is about two centimetres in diameter and it's impossible to see the whole thing with high spatial resolution with a normal light microscope. So this image registration tool is probably familiar to you, but in case it's not, the researcher prepares the, the specimen whether it's absorption staining or stained at all, doesn't actually matter. Images uh, specimen using uh, an objective lens of modest uh, magnification and numerical aperture so that the subcellular detail can normally be seen. Images one, region of interest, and then moves the specimen laterally, and images another region of interest and so on, and builds up this kind of mosaicing uh, of the, the, the tissue uh, specimen. Uh, then each one of these individual image uh, patches is registered relative to its neighbour using software tools, some of which are open source, which are great to, to see in the community, um, and a full reconstruction of as much of the tissue specimen as you want to see can be made. Now, this, this is very powerful and it's used to great effect even in slide scanning technologies. That, however, it does have its limitations. So, um, two of these limitations. I can describe to you today. The first one is one that you can see very clearly, where there are dark bands that surround each one of these little image patches. Uh, now, these bands are not an artifact to the specimen preparation. Uh, it's not the dye penetration, for example. Um, it's a result of the inhomogeneity of the light that is applied to each individual region of interest that is then stitched together. So these are imaging artifacts. Uh, so that has a downstream consequence of uh, reducing the ability to quantify um, 
for example, line intensity measurements, if you're interested in measuring from here to here, for example, you're, you're going to struggle a bit, but there's going to be artifacts in there, and it may not give you the best you know, representation of what the specimen actually looks like. There is another uh, downside to this, the second one, um, which is the registration of the image patch relative to its neighbour. So this, this is very difficult to achieve in a seamless way because specimen stages often have inertia, uh, backlash, um, and computational methods are, are not absolutely seamless. And so having perfect registration with two adjacent images it is really very difficult to achieve. Now this problem only gets a lot worse when you think about the three dimensions and you've got an image cube rather than an, an, an image single plane. And so you're trying to image, uh, register the thousands potentially of images all relative to one arbitrary point in specimen. So again, for quantification, but also just visual um, assessment, it, it makes it extremely difficult indeed. So there are other techniques for studying these large um, tissue specimens, such as mouse embryos, the type that you should see in this slide here. Some of them are non-optical. Um, so macro CT, uh, for example, is a, is a great technique that's been used to a uh, good effect, where the researcher prepares their, their uh, tissue specimen, illuminates from one side, detects from the other, and then rotates the specimen in three dimensions around the, the uh, central axis, and at each point of rotation takes an image at the opposite side to the illumination source. And in doing so, they can build up a 3D uh, tomographic reconstruction <coughs> of the specimen. <coughs> the, the difficulty with this technique, elegant though it is in its ability to potentially in the optical regime at least use low power, low intensity, low cost um, components, uh, such as white, white light bulb effectively, and a conventional camera, the, the difficulty appears if you're interested in the limit that's around the single cell. So these techniques are low resolution spatially. Uh, they're computationally fairly demanding uh, to make these 3D reconstructions, so they're extremely elegant. Uh, so in this panel C for this paper that I've um, uh, that I referenced from the Long Group in, in Public Development 2014, you can see that they've used some really quite exquisite colour coding of, for example, regions of the brain to, to give the visual appearance that can uh, help with assessment and interrogation of data sets. The problem is that we have this macro scale anatomy clearly resolved. So you can see organs, <clears throat> you can probably see some regions of organs, which is it's shown in, in brain here on the dot. Um, but the difficulty comes when you get to the single cell because these tomographic reconstruction techniques rarely can see single cells and they cannot see the subcellular limit at all. So it makes it a bit tricky to, to use for, for some applications. Thankfully, we're not the only people that are concerned about the mesoscale. So there are now um, other mesoscale imaging systems available um, that are kind of complementary to the mesolens. And I'd like to take a moment or two to explain what these current systems do. So one uh, system is from Spencer Smith's group um, when they were based at Chapel Hill, we've moved now to the West Coast. Um, and this is a multi-photon only mesoscopic imaging system. So if you care about optical diagrams, you can look at the, 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 path, the uh, schematic in the left hand side, but explain briefly with us. Uh, it's primarily designed not just for multi-photon, but for imaging of uh, neural dynamics. And the premise is such that the mouse brain, which is, let's say, 10 millimetres in diameter, um, the, the researcher may not wish to study all of the brain regions simultaneously. So instead, the researcher chooses two, and I believe it's now up to four or eight regions of interest. And you study 512 by 512 pixel box sizes. You can scan in the axial direction as well, so you get an image cube. And you only study these sub-regions of brain. So although it has a mesoscopic um, range, you're only studying simultaneously microscopic regions within. Now, for some applications, that's absolutely fine, and neural dynamics is, is a, a key example of that, where, for example, using um, the uh, GCAMP uh, expressing mice, it's possible to look at neuronal activity in, for example, the hippocampus, um, or look at both the, the, the right and left ventricle, for example. So that, that becomes quite a useful tool that affords the researcher the possibility to look at long range uh, dynamics and look at correlation and, and cause and effect. There is another system 
which was produced by Karel Svoboda's um, group at Genelia. And this, again, is primarily a multi-photon system, and it's aimed at looking at the mesoscale. But instead of the researcher choosing only two or four or eight subregions of tissue, it uses random access scanning, where um, there's a stochastic approach. So where within the brain tissue the researcher will study, and it's, it's not up to the researcher. So the researcher will put the specimen on, normally um, it's a mouse brain, you know, skull uh, removed, water dipping lens, and uh, if you basically click go, the region of interest, which is again about 5 to 12 by 5 to 12 pixels, will randomly sample uh, the brain dynamics using, again, a calcium ex a reporter mice, um, and in, in order to try and build up more of an, a representation of what the whole brain dynamics are, because rather than looking at sub-regions of the brain, it's looking at a global view. Um, it's quick, so each jump between successive image cubes or areas is a, an order of 6 to 10 milliseconds. Um, so to image the whole brain, I mean, it's, it's going to take some time, but it, it certainly allows the researcher to study the music the, the, This instrument is also now commercially available, so you can buy one of these things from Thorlabs, which is great. It has a price tag that's commensurate with the technology involved. It's probably going to cost you the close to around three quarters of a million. Uh, British pounds. Um, so, but it's good to see that these technologies are now making it out and into, into the wild. Our approach to the mesoscale is quite different to the instruments that I've just shown you. So, firstly, we've realised that um, not all researchers want to look at mouse brain. They maybe have other tissues that they want to study um, and they want to be able to see the whole thing at once. So, we started from first principles, because we are, we are an optical physics group, we think we know a wee bit about how light propagates and also how to design instruments to, to allow the biomedical researcher to see that bit more from the specimen. So on this slide, what you see at the moment are the really resolution profiles of objective lenses that may be available in your own labs or institutes, um, possibly rolling around in a drawer if they're anything like my labs, um, and they're not in specimen space, these are in image space. So irrespective of whether you have a high magnification, high numerical aperture, such as the type shown on the left-hand side, or a low magnification, low numerical aperture lens, the type shown on the right-hand side, um, I'll try and find a pointer here, which might be useful. You'll see that these really resolution profiles look almost the same. And the reason for this is an historical accident. And it's the fact that until extremely recently, the light microscope was designed with the human eye as its detector. And the visual acuity of the human eye was a 10 times eyepiece is around 7 micron. And in the same image space as with these uh, objective lens performances here, you see that the resolution profile is kind of similar to the visual acuity of the human eye. And that's because there was no point in building a microscope that could see more than the eye could. Um, because normally the researcher would draw what they could see down the light microscope, but we're not really in that space anymore. That's not to say that these objectives are now useless. They're not. They're, they're great. These are fabulous objective lenses, especially this one here. I mean, this, this is a flagship, high magnification, high numerical aperture lens, great for immunofluorescence and immunohistochemistry imaging. It will give you sub-micron resolution performance in three dimensions. Um, the problem is that this lens will only sample, allow you to sample a very tiny fraction of a millimetre of tissue. So although the, the resolution that you get is fabulous, the, you, you're only seeing it from a tiny tissue volume, and that may not be representative of the, the larger tissue specimen. If you're interested in larger tissue specimens, normally you go to something that has a low magnification, but that also has a low numerical aperture, which means that the, the resolution is going to be poor as well. So for this type of lens, which you can buy for like 500 pounds, um, you can image over 100 cubic millimetres of tissue, which is great. Um, that, that's probably about a quarter of a P, if you're interested in just thinking about what that is in, in spatial scale. But the difficulty here is that you don't have subcellular resolution in three dimensions. So you, you get a trade-off. So that's why we, we have this range of objective lenses, but they still don't do absolutely everything that we want. So to that end, we've designed the mesolens. Now, the mesolens can, has a unique combination 
of low magnification and high numerical aperture. So it means that we can image well, this 118 cubic millimetres, roughly, um, but we have the resolution that comes from the high numerical aperture. So we're now in a subcellular space, a uh, resolution space within over 100 uh, cubic millimetres of tissue. So we know now we no longer need to compromise on the amount of spatial detail within the, the tissue image uh, volume. So we, we hope this is going to be useful. I mean, so far it seems to be. So now I'd like to explain a wee bit about the nasal lens itself and how we've went about designing it, building it and turning it into a microscope. So in this uh, slide here, on the left hand side, this is a cartoon diagram of the light path of a normal optical microscope. Where the specimen sits here, you have your objective lens, your eyepiece, and then your puny human eye is the detector up here. Uh, this to scale next to it is the nasal lens. And you'll see that it's gigantic. This, this is not the whole microscope, this is just the objective lens. It's roughly the same length as a human arm. And it's well, depending on how much you, you lift, it's probably the same width as a human arm as well. Specimen sits here, and you see that firstly, it's not just like that. I mean, the, the, this is wide, um, and the reason that the individual lens elements in these lens are so large in diameter is that we need to think about having high numerical aperture, so we need good collection. And effectively, what we want to do is take each individual point in the specimen plane and relay it to a camera which sits way beyond uh, the optical path of the diagram that's shown here in the image detection plane. So the way that we set about um, coming up with this nasal lens in the first place was we uh, worked very closely with one of the best lens develop designers in the UK, um, who is normally designing telescope. Telescope is just a microscope upside down, so we, we figured he was a good person to speak to. So closely with him, we were using uh, ZMAX, the industrial standard for lens design software, to devise what the nasal lens prescription would be. Once we had a prescription that we thought was going to work, we visit a glass factory in Wales uh, with a UV laser pointer and we batch test the individual glass types, because there's about 10 different types of glass within the lens prescription, to assess it for fluorescence. So what you see here uh, is a photograph of two different pieces of what's supposed to be BK7. BK7 is a standard optical glass. And we've put a 405 nanometer laser pointer through it. So you can see that this top bill, uh, uh, cut piece of glass here uh, has some weak orange fluorescence that runs through the centre. This one has some bright blue-green fluorescence. Now, bear in mind that both of these pieces of glass are meant to be BK7. It's clear that they're not the same. The fluorescence here comes from dopant ions that have been introduced to the glass type when it's been uh, being grown from single crystal to try and stabilise it over long term. That's why Leyland Hooks original microscopes no longer exist because they didn't have this long term stability in the glass. Uh, the problem for us is that any fluorescence within the objective lens uh, glass itself is going to overwhelm when it gets to the image and we end up with a very poor quality uh, contrast of fluorescence image. So we need to back test every one of these glass types to make sure that they're not fluorescent. Once we've done that, we then put a deposit in the glass to the manufacturer and we return to ZMAX armed with the Abbey number, cell, cell mark coefficients, fine details, dispersion parameters of each one of the different glass types that we're going to be using these lens. And we need on ZMAX to make sure that with our updated lens catalogue, it's going to work for us. Uh, we don't have the capability to then turn these giant blocks of glass into lenses at Strathclyde. So we farm that out to a third party. It's a spin out from Imperial College. And they're one of the few optical um, grinders and suppliers who can mount the lenses to the precision that we need for the nasal lens. So each one of these individual lens elements here has to be centered to a tolerance that's better than about three micron. So they have a great engineering precision as well. We're also quite confident that they can make the, the lenses that we need because they are the same uh, outfit that supplied the gravitational wave program LIGO with their end mirrors for the interferometers. Now these are meters in diameter with uh, land over 100 flatness. So yeah, we, we knew that we were speaking to the right people. 
I'll leave most of these numbers here for you to look at at your leisure, but the, the important parameters are, we've already spoken about resolution, so we know that we've got subsidies of resolution in theory. We have uh, an imaging field that's about six millimetres in diameter, and we've designed a measles lens that has a three millimetre working distance, so that we can image through into three dimensions and reasonably thick tissue pieces. It's a multi-immersion lens, so we've got multiple correction colours, so we can move individual lens groups up and down relative to each other to compensate for different, or allow the use of different uh, refractive index uh, mounting medium, media, and uh, so we can work with oil, water, glycerol. We can also form an engineer, it's just the resolution performance isn't quite as per the 600 nanometer axial and about 4 micron, uh, sorry, 600 nanometer lateral and 4 micron axial that, that we, we would want to be able to provide. Roughly 90% of the effort in designing the nasal lens goes into managing chromatic correction. If we only needed a monochromatic nasal lens, one colour, such as the kind of multi-photon type approaches that um, from the Svoboda or Smith groups, they're, they're fixed in wavelengths, for example, to only GFP, then it's reasonably straightforward. The problem is that biology isn't straightforward, and neither are the combination of proteins or fluorescent stains or absorption stains that the biologist wants to use. So we need to provide chromatic connection across the entire spectrum for the image to be as good as it can possibly be. Now in a previous slide I showed you the really resolution profile of the measles lens compared to the other objectives in the lab. Um, this richness of information, the high resolution that the measles lens gives us within this gigantic image cube means that we start dealing with a lot of data very quickly. So for a single optical section, uh, so 2D only, single colour, from Nyquist sampling um, across the roughly six millimetre field in these lines, that means we end up with an image of about 400 megapixels. Uh, we then put in another couple of colours, so that gets us to about 1.5 gigabytes. To sample through the full three millimetre working distance of the these lines, we need um, about 1,000 optical sections. So that 1.5 gigabyte becomes 1.5 terabytes, and that's for a quick sample. So you can start to see how um, the, the data volume rapidly ramps up. I also mentioned that the time taken to build an image is variable, and that depends on whether we use confocal or wide field imaging. And I'll explain both of these in a moment or two. But before I forget, the main point is that because we have so many pixels that we need to scan over in confocal, even with a quarter of a microsecond to dwell time, it can take us days, if not weeks, to image one tissue volume at very high speed, uh, very high resolution. Camera is much faster um, as cameras normally tend to be compared to a confocal microscope, but there are also limitations there, and I'll explain those as we go along. So when we designed the measles lens, we had in mind to use it as a confocal lens for three-dimensional imaging, so that's where I'd probably like to begin. If you're familiar with the confocal microscope principle, you'll probably recognise this diagram on the left-hand side as a confocal microscope, where you have a laser, you have a pair of scanning gavel mirrors, you have your objective lens, a specimen, confocal iris, and a photomultiplant tube to detect the light. So really, we have a gigantic scanning confocal microscope. Now, the gigantic parts of that are the objective lens, which in our case is the lens, the scan lens, and also the scanning mirrors. So the scanning mirrors are roughly the same size as a car wing mirror. And the reason that they need to be so large is because we need to overfill the back aperture of the, of the lens for um, full resolution and using the full uh, numerical aperture uh, at, at the specimen plane here. This is a photograph of what the measles lens looks like in its current incarnation, which is the Mark II. Uh, this is the measles lens part here, and the optics extend back through this tube here. Uh, although I've described the human eye as largely redundant, like microscopy, there's still the comfort factor, and it's great to be able to <laughs> just put a specimen on it. So I made sure that we now have binocular viewers here. Specimen sits, specimen plane here. We try and use commercial components wherever we can for everything else. The footprint of this is around a cubic metre, and all the lasers and other electronics and computers and so on just sit in the optical bench behind. This slide shows one of the earliest data sets that we took with the measles. The specimen is a nine and a half day old mouse embryo, 
Uh, it's been stained with the nuclear matter of acidity orange and it's been cleared in BAB, so a mixture of benzyl alcohol and benzyl benzoate. We started by imaging this specimen in XZ, so through the centre of the mouse cross section using a conventional confocal microscope. We use a Leica because it's the one that we have in the lab uh, with low magnification and the normal low, mag uh, low numerical aperture. And perhaps unsurprisingly, because of the poor axial response of this low numerical aperture lens, each one of the cell nuclei looks like a long, thin needle of light. And so in axial direction, the image is actually being poor. We can see the, the full length, the, the, the mouse embryos, it's only about you know, a couple of millimetres or so. We can see gross anatomical features, such as this uh, cavity of uh, hindbrain here. But as for any other detail, it's effectively obscured, and it's just a consequence of the, the low any. When we put the same specimen on the mesolens, everything sharpens right up. So we're imaging at exactly the same point and the same uh, direction and dimension. So while, for example, the neural tube, which should be up here, is just completely obscured in the confocal, um, the ordinary confocal microscope with the mesolens, you see the neural tube, you see the blood vessels that surround the neural tube, and when we zoom in, which we'll do in a later slide to a, a later data set, you can see um, the, the, the high spatial detail that, that the mesolens data affords. So I appreciate that an XZ cross section is quite difficult to get a sense of um, what, what the, the uh, microscope can do. So here we're looking at a later stage mouse centro. This is day 12. Uh, this is dual stain. So the yellow uh, contrast that you see here is from uh, the same nuclear marker acting in orange as shown in the previous slide. The blue is a neuronal variant of beta tubulin that's labelled um, with, a, so it's antibody labelling with Alexa 5.4 conjugate. So this is much down sampled for presentation, but it shows, even with a static image here, the micro scale anatomy of the mouse, where we can see we've got kind of an edge of brain here, we've got an eye here, we've got some ribs down this end, probably got a bit of liver here. Um, but if our point allows, and if I can uh, stop having a laser pointer, um, if I press play in this movie, we have moved the specimen in increments of three micron up towards the lens, lens, we use it as an upright lens. And these, each successive image over only about 200 micron or so, we start to see new imaging uh, detail at depth within the tissue specimen. So if I play that again, you'll see that, uh, for example, these ribs disappear and the liver comes into focus. We start to get about a heart up here somewhere. Um, the eye, where we're obviously at the near surface of the eye, we start to image deeper in. Um, you start to resolve more of the brain uh, and so on. So, but we can image the whole uh, specimen without any stitching in time when none of these artifacts. And it looks quite nice. So you see that the, the macro scale anatomy. But unfortunately, this data set doesn't, at this display magnification, show you the, the high resolution detail that the next can give. So I've cropped out a region of the eye here. And if we advance to the next slide, it looks like this. So again, you can press play in this movie, but I'd first I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that this is the edge of the lens of the eye. This is the, the retina, uh, this, this uh, ring around here. Uh, and these little yellow blobs, not cells, these are individual nuclei. So what this means is that in three dimensions, if press play and we just advance through the movie, we now have subcellular resolution throughout that entire over 100 cubic, uh, 10 cubic millimetres volume. So here, for example, we can watch as the, the retina expands and then as we go deeper into the specimen, collapses and goes on to form the optic nerve. So we now have a holistic view of the tissue specimen rather than cherry picking that, that little region that we care about. So although we had the mouse atlas community in mind when, as one of the main users of the mesolens, we, we recognise that that's just scratching the surface of what the biomedical researcher wants to look at. So we, for example, have developed protocols for the fixation, staining and clearing of whole um, Drosophila uh, as one of the, ma the main model organisms. And this is a, a lovely image, um, absolutely not biased at all, um, of an adult female Drosophila. But and while it is quite a nice image, actually it's more than it reveals. So I'd like to show you what the raw data looks like. 
So this is a screen grab of me panning and zooming through the data set in MSG. So we'll press play. Currently the head end of the fly, um, this is the edge of the lens of the eye, and if we just drag the image uh, through, uh, we know it's a female. These, these are the ovaries of the fly, and we can simulate focusing in the data set just by, again, moving the slider up and down, we can go through the gut, we up through the saliva, the gland, we've got fine rows of flight muscle here, because the wings are here and here. You can see edges of legs and cross section up through the cardia. Um, back to the brain. Um, and this, the stain in here is just a nuclear marker. We've not done anything particularly fancy. Um, but, for example, we're now working with uh, Drosophila groups in the UK and overseas. We're using this organism as their main uh, research tool to study, for example, parasitic infection. And rather than assuming that all of the parasites uh, are accumulating within the salivary gland, they can now look at, for example, the gut, see if the parasites are making their way, in, their way into the brain, and they have this global view of infection uh, and ageing uh, in the intact organism, which we, we believe is, is totally new. So as well as the 3D imaging, um, we realised that we kind of missed a trick when we started doing this 3D imaging, and that there was a whole lot of people out there that wanted to just do 2D imaging using the wide field approach. The problem is the number of pixels that we need. So I've already explained that ideally we'd like 400 megapixels, and no commercial camera is going to give us that. So the next best thing we've found is a sensor shifting camera. Uh, so these are now commercially available. Uh, we bought one from Viworks. They now sell a slightly fancier version of more pixels than this one, but it's, it's still good for, for an application. So this is a 28 megapixel sensor, and it's located on a two orthogonal uh, piezo electric transducers. And rather than moving the sensor by a full sensor width, what happens is you apply a small voltage to the piezo, and uh, you move it by a fraction of a pixel width. So in our case, we move it by a third and a third and a third. And we do that 10 times, 3 by 3 or 8, we'll get 9 images. We then perform an operation that looks a lot like deconvolution, and in doing so, we can effectively multiply the pixel number by 9, divide the pixel area by 9, and it gives us about 260 megapixel image. So when we shrink the field of view, uh, field of view of these lines from around 6 millimeters to about 4.5, we're now NICO sampled. So it's still more than uh, the normal 4x lens can give us, but with the advantage of high spatial resolution, across that four and a bit millimetre field. Uh, so it's got a CCD is, is at its heart, and we've used it for many different uh, wide field imaging uh, techniques, um, bright field, dark field, but fluorescence tends to be the one that most people come back to. So this is an epithelial uh, cell prep. The green is fluorescein phylloid, and the red is mitre tracker red, and blue is the marker DAPI. Um, I like this image because it shows one of the advantages of these lines. So this is a proprietary slide. It's not one that we've uh, produced in our own lab, um, but we bought it from uh, Theron Fisher. And uh, it looks like a nice slide if you look over here. The problem is if you look over here, something's not right. So either the dye, the fluorescein fluorescent dye hasn't penetrated to this region of the tissue, which is why you don't see any green, or it may be that these cells just lack the, the effactin that the, the fluorescein fluorescent would normally bind to. So if this is your cell prep, you would probably want to choose a region over here, but it may not be representative of the entire the, the entire tissue prep. So, for reducing the subconscious bias that we inevitably bring to our studies, the mesolens can help reduce that because we now have we can see more than we, we would normally see with our conventional uh, light microscope across a, a wide area. And again, if we just digitally zoom in to a region. And again, zoom away from that region, but you, just to show the resolution capability in the field, we can individually resolve these individual nuclei. We can see uh, bundles of F act, and, uh, and the image quality is quite good. We are at the moment limited to the speed acquisition at the moment uh, here. So each, because we need to take nine images, even with a 100 millisecond exposure or so, uh, it probably takes us about five seconds to build an image. So we're not quite at the point yet when we produce this for, for example, calcium signaling, but the newer camera that Fireworks have produced gives around three, uh, I think it's something like eight frames per second. So we might be starting to head towards that space sometime soon. 
I've also done quite a lot of brain field imaging, uh, so in collaboration with colleagues at UCL and uh, National Physical Lab, we've been using different and comparing different mesoscopic imaging tools for their use in malaria diagnosis. So there are normally two types of uh, blood prep when assessing malaria uh, infection. You can have a blood drop, which is thick, or a smear, which is thin. And these regions just show high resolution images of what these cells look like. But ideally, what we want to be able to do is to detect the, the malarial parasite within the intact uh, red cell. So we compared the performance of different uh, techniques using a normal uh, bright field uh, illumination. We used a convolutional neural network to enhance then the bright field image. We studied the application of these films using the measles lens, and we also looked at Fourier uh, tachyographic microscopy. Um, the the take home from this is that all of these techniques seem useful. Um, we can detect the parasites with all of these techniques, but one of the things that I think excites me at the moment is the possibility of combining uh, deep learning through the convolutional neural network approach um, to the measles lens datasets because we know using a, a 20x lens with a numerical aperture that's very similar to that, uh, that the measles lens affords us, that we can recover spatial detail um, of the individual parasites within the erythrocytes uh, that looks remarkably similar to the ground truth. For this, we're going to need a lot more computational power, but I, I think it's probably within uh, a remit of the area. So. Right. I realise I'm taking up all your time, but I'd like to take another few minutes to tell you about what we're doing now and what we would like to do next. So the first thing is that there's no point in us having measles lenses and nobody else being able to use them. So we've set up a measles lab at Strathclyde. It's a small user facility where people can send the specimens, come along, COVID restrictions, restrictions permitting, and do some imaging with this in collaboration. So if you're interested in doing any measles imaging, more than happy for you to reach out to us, do get in touch and we'll see if we can help you with your own research. We've been working with people at the National Institute for uh, Biological Standards and Controls uh, and the press playing this movie is on chat. The specimen that you, that you see here is a whole lobe of mouse lung and the little colourful dots that you see here are individual TB bacilli. So the researchers at NIPSC have used a combination of chlorine orange and chlorine B to label up the TB infection that's within this whole giant lobe of tissue. We use optical clearing methods and then we developed an image analysis pipeline to look at clustering and heterogeneity and cellular counting within this mesoscopic uh, tissue volume. So this is work that I think is published a few months ago now. Um, for us, this gave us a lot of confidence that measles would have broader application than what we were first anticipating. We've also been working with, uh, I'll be showing quite a lot of unpublished work as well, um, and I, I don't mind if this is kind of shared, so it's, it's not a problem at all. Um, the specimen that you're looking at here is what we've been doing in collaboration with a local group in Glasgow, uh, the University of Glasgow, instead of Strathclyde, and they're interested in studying a trypanosome infection. So, at this level of display zoom, the cyan colour that you see here, DAPI labelled cell nuclei, but if I press play and we've got a few random artifacts that we can get past, once we get deep into the tissue, you see these red blobs. And red blobs are trypanosomes. So these are TD tomato expressing trypanosomes, and the mouse was infected uh, 21 days prior to um, the tissue being excised and cleared and uh, then subsequently managed by us. Now, this gives um, Juan Quintana and other colleagues at Glasgow this global view of infection. So until recently, the, the normal approach is to take tiny tissue volumes, hope there are a few parasites in there, and that's about it. We can now tell them, for example, whether there's clustering. We have the spatial resolution to tell them um, about this, the stage in the life cycle of the individual trypanosomes, so if they're short and stumpy or long, elongated, and um, that tells us where, where we are within the replication cycle um, of the parasite, and also spatially where we are. So for example, one scheme of thought at the moment is that these trypanosomes enter the brain uh, through the brain stem, and so we now can resolve that in intact tissue, uh, both at the micro and the mesoscale. 
we've used Denise Lenz to study uh, the architecture of whole mature colony biofilms. So this is work done by one of my previous PhD students, Dean Rooney, who's now at Perry Watt University. And if you look by eye at an E. coli colony that's sufficiently mature, a few days old, it looks smooth and dome-shaped. Um, but using these lens, we'll be able to look at the sub-level uh, architecture. And what we see is this exquisite net, uh, network of intercolony channels. So Liam, being an excellent microbiologist, was able to do a number of experiments that, that showed the, the role of these channels is likely to be in the provision of nutrients to sustain the biomass. So this is a 2D image we've zoomed in, we can see the individual E. coli. We've been able to do 3D mapping to understand exactly how the channels uh, orient themselves and how they pervade in three dimensions. Um, and this work has now been followed up by another PhD student, uh, Bea Batura, who is developing some really quite nice software tools uh, based on unwrapping or uh, uh, kind of polar unwrapping of these uh, radial uh, colonies to understand exactly how the channels uh, vary in structure at different heights within the, the colony themselves. Um, and our overall aim here is to try and eventually exploit the fact that we now know these channels exist to get antimicrobial disperse, dispersing agents into the biomass rather than nutrients to support it. Uh, almost everything I've shown you until that previous slide was in fixed tissue, um, but we have been able to do some live cell imaging as well as the bacteria. The movie that I'm showing now is an, uh, an image of a Drosophila pupae, pupa, sorry. And the contrast that you see here uh, comes from the fact that the hemocytes are, uh, are expressing green fluorescent protein. So this is preliminary data with Jenny Reagan from the University of Edinburgh, and she's interested in the flow of hemocytes within the intact living organism. So you can see that at the bottom here, there's a little pump. That you can see the, the pulsatile nature uh, as the hemocytes circulate through this uh, nascent object. And we can use uh, methods to not just look at this in 2D, but also in 3D. So normally, Jenny is, is limited to having only a few, maybe 10 hemocytes within a single field of view. We can now show the whole intact organism, and it survives elimination and detection for quite a long time because the high numeric aperture in these lines means it will be great light collection efficiency, which also has benefits for reduced phototoxicity and photoleaching. Um, this is a different specimen. This is this is very different. This this was prepared by one of my PhD students, Nate Clapper, who we found out won an IOP post a prize this morning, so she's very pleased and so she should be. The green contrast that you see here is from a human tonsil. So each week we receive um, or we collect excised human tonsils from uh, the, a local hospital and we're working very closely with clinician Catherine Douglas um, who is interested to understand the role of bacterial infection in recute, uh, recurrent acute uh, tonsillitis. So tonsillitis sounds like a very straightforward childhood um, disease. It's absolutely not. It has one of the highest post-operative bleeds uh, and costs the NHS so much money, I was astonished. So we've been taking these tonsil tissues from Catriona each week and processing them for mesoscale imaging to get a sense of the, 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 bio, the bacterial burden um, in tonsillitis. So the green contrast here comes from reflection mesoscale imaging. If I press play, we can you know, render this uh, the, the tonsil surface in three dimensions. And then around halfway through, and some magenta is going to appear, and that's fluorescence labelling of the bacterial population. And what you'll see is it's vast. Now, there is the normal healthy bacterial population. Um, so if you do a, a throat swab of someone, they're likely to have some group A strep uh, within their throat. What we're starting to understand now is that the bacterial infection is much more significant than we first understood, and we can use mesoscale imaging as a means to better understand the, just the widespread nature of this infection. Okay, I'm going to take another couple of minutes just to tell you exactly what we're doing now. So the first thing is we're building a light sheet for the nasal lens. The confocal imaging is great, but for a lot of high throughput and high content imaging, it's just too slow. However, it's not trivial to make a light sheet for the nasal lens. Normal Gaussian optics means that if we focus the, the light sheet to an axial width that's commensurate with the resolution in the nasal lens, it would only propagate over a couple of hundred microns, but our field of view is 
four millimetres, six millimetres or so. So we've had to design an, a propagation invariant light sheet. It's based on an area beam principle for long propagation of a very thin light sheet. And we've we applied for a bunch of funding for this, didn't get it, so well, we've done it anyway. So this specimen here, so this is um, a screen grab of uh, what the Napari GUI uh, will yield for us when we look at a whole preparation of um, it's an intact entire mouse pancreas, which we have fixed, stained with a nuclear marker, and then cleared using a bab. If I press play, the, the start of the movie looks okay. You can see that we've got some light sheet streaking artifacts here, perhaps not to be expected. We can interrogate this data set using the free uh, open source Napari uh, browser. It, it all looks fine. I'm going to move towards the end of this movie, however. So this is a preparation that was made by a student, Katrina Wiesencraft. It was imaged by Eliana Battistella, who designed the light sheet and built it. And as we zoom in, we see individual cell nuclei. So this has confirmed for us that we have the same subcellular resolution in the light sheet mesoscale as we do in the light sheet, uh, sorry, the confocal mesolens. Now, for those of you that are familiar with the mesospin project, um, this might sound kind of similar, except we have one advantage, which is we have that resolution at any magnification. Whereas the numerical aperture, the mesospin, mesospin scales depending on the level of uh, magnification and zoom that is applied. So that this subcellular resolution, for example, is not possible across an entire nose pancreas. Another thing that we're working on is a totally new mesolens, because although 100 cubic millimetres is great, people want more. And I can understand why. So for example, even for the tonsil project that I mentioned, we still want to see in the surface of the tonsil. It would be great to see, for example, whether there is infection within the bacterial crypts or even in the core. So to that end, we've designed a new mesolens. So this has a much longer working distance, 11 millimetres. And it's also, we've extended the chromatic correction so that we can work at the multi-photon regime, going to two and three photon excitation. We can probably image almost an entire mouse brain as well, which to um, work well with a lot of the existing collaborations that we have with uh, neuroscience and infection groups. On the horizon, we also have increased spatial resolution. So we're currently working on a TIRF mode, so the total internal reflection fluorescence imaging mode for these lines, so that we can look at, uh, for example, uh, the utility of novel antimicrobial peptides in collaboration with um, microfluidics uh, and measurement groups. And we've also been working towards um, a structured elimination uh, mode. At the moment, we're limited by the camera that we have, but we have the rest of the toolbox up and running. Um, and yeah, it's, it's starting to work out well. We're also always open to ideas. So if the mesolens doesn't do what you'd like it to do, um, do talk to us. We're happy to discuss what your requirements may be. So with that, I will fin finish. I'd like to thank everyone at Strathclyde that's been involved. Um, our UK and overseas collaborators for sending the specimens and being as excited about it as we are, and also the funders for well, making a lot of this work possible because it's rather expensive and we appreciate this. And I'd like to conclude finally by thanking you very much for coming on today and hearing what I've got to say. So thank you. Thank you, Gail. That very impressive as ever. Um, makes my career seem very unproductive. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. I must remember that this is about 15 years worth of work, so. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, even so. I, I, I'm not sure I'm going to get anywhere near that, but yeah, hugely impressive and fascinating. Um, we've got time for a few questions if anybody has any. Uh, either drop them in the chat or put your hand up if you'd like to ask Gail anything. Sure, somebody must have something. I hope someone has something. No. Okay, in the meantime, so Gail, I know you've done quite a lot of work on biofilm formation, like we showed with the uh, E. coli. We had a chat about this last time. Um, have you gone any further looking at any multicellular makeups? Um, and kind of stratification of, um, of bacterial layers of makeup of biofilms because I know like with the with your tonsil work the, the 
biofilm is much more important than kind of the individual bacteria and the uh, pathogenesis and that kind of thing. It's so we've moved this on quite a lot. Um, so the we now have a Dorothy Hodgkin fellow um, that's joined us who is working with multi-species, multi-stream uh, bacterial colonies. So Catherine Baxter is doing quite a lot of work on uh, Candida, E. coli, and Pseudomonas-based um, biofilms. So looking at kind of interspecies. Um, interactions. We're not quite inter-kingdom yet, but that's probably not too far away. Um, so yeah, I mean, for the tonsil work, it would be great for us to start elucidating the different um, bacterial species in the tonsil. We have applied for funding to do mesoscale fish, um, so that was rejected, but we're going to try and find other ways to get the funding, because rather than doing PCR from tonsil swabs, we want to know where the bacteria are, because if they are very deep in the tonsil core, there's no point in applying something, you know, topical. So, yeah. Absolutely. Early results seem to indicate that the bacterial population is not what we thought it was, um, in terms of even just the, the, level, the proportion of gram-positive to gram-negative bacteria. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we've got a couple of questions coming. One is... Uh, how fast is the meso light sheet that you're developing? Okay, so it obviously depends on the tissue volume that you want to study, but it's a lot faster than confocal. So I think, as an example, we imaged uh, an ultra thick section of mouse brain um, from Juan Quintana, the person that we're working with, the trapanosome um, work with. I think in confocal, it took us around six days to image. Um, that's not to count the time that it takes to save the data, which is not also not quite. <laughs> it probably takes us about six to eight hours to save it, and then there's any post processing and so on. So let's say a week among friends. Um, to acquire the same volume with the light sheet, I think took four hours. So I realise it's not in the same speed scale that we're at with um, a normal light sheet microscope, but given the density and richness of the information that we're able to get with the light sheet and lens, it, it does still seem worthwhile. So we end up with four hours to acquire, about one hour to two hours to save. No, it must, it must be longer. It was four hours to acquire, eight hours to save, because there's roughly the same amount of saving time, naturally. Um, and then, yeah, after that, we can do what we're like. But the acquisition time it, it is a lot faster. Um, and I think that was with 100 millisecond exposures per sensor area, roughly five seconds to uh, acquire one individual image plane and then move on. Okay. Hope that answers the okay. question, but if not, come back to me, please. Okay. Um, so I, I realise we're rapidly approaching the one o'clock mark. Um, and yeah. So if, if nobody's got anything further, um, I'd like to thank Gail for an absolutely brilliant talk as ever, um, fascinating and Gail let me know if, if you get any interactions, if there's any, anything comes, um, if not you, you might hear from me at some point on some mucosal work, um, but thank you again, absolutely brilliant and fascinating, great way to start off. Um, for the next talk we have Dr Sam Giles from the University of Birmingham who is a paleontologist who uses uh, CT scanning to um, analyze uh, fossil anatomy internally. Um, I won't pretend to know much more about it than that because it's, it's really not my, my area, but uh, having read some of her papers from what, from what I do understand, uh, it's absolutely fascinating and uh, she uses different applications beyond just CT as well. But uh, so. That's one. I hope you can all make it for that in a month's time. Otherwise, thank you all very much for attending. Thank you.